All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is our IAS Distinguished Lecturer, and it's very uh, honored, and we are very happy to have Professor Jen Gianluca Isarino, <laughs> Professor Gianluca Isarino, to come here to give us a face-to-face -face lecture, which hasn't been held for a long time. So, um, let me just briefly introduce Professor Carino. Uh, he got his PhD in um, back in Italy, and then he worked worked at uh, the Center of Turbulence at uh, uh, Stanford University. I think it's also a key lab. Uh, funded by NASA for many years, and he also uh, uh, worked as a professor at uh, uh, University of Stanford. And uh, his main research contribution is the numerical methods for fluid mechanics and uh, physics modeling uh, for the understanding of both lamina and uh, maybe turbulence mainly turbulence flows. And also, I think uh, today he also will mention like the uncertainty analysis by computer science. So let's welcome Professor Acarino. So uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me here. Um, I, I have prepared a presentation to give you a sort of an overview of, uh, of uh, the field of uh, uncertainty analysis that I've been involved in in the last uh, uh, decade or so. Um, and uh, uh, this is a, supposed to be a, a relatively high-level presentation, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but obviously I'm happy to, to answer questions and perhaps have a discussion afterwards on, on the specifics. Um, so let me start from, from the title. Um, you might be familiar with a, a slightly different version of this, uh, uh, of this statement, uh, which is uh, very, very famous from, uh, from Professor Box. Uh, um, and uh, uh, the, the reason why I, I changed a little bit is, is going to be clear as we move forward. Um, but um, I think it will be useful to, as a start for this, for this discussion to, to really go um, in details of sort of the element about, about this statement. So the first is clearly models. And I think it is important to start um, thinking about models and what I refer to as, as models in, in this talk. Um, as you're certainly aware, as you're you know, very familiar with, we are uh, surrounded by models. Everything that we do, in a sense, is, is controlled or perhaps uh, um, uh, uh, involves uh, some sort of a model. Um, so every day we look at the weather and, and, uh, on, on our uh, iPhones, and, and definitely uh, modeling for that is, uh, is prevalent and, and provides information both on uh, current situation, but also uh, forecast. So that's definitely a model. Um, some of the models are mar much more mundane. Uh, we are exposed to models that provide us recommendations for, for what to do next. Again, a prediction of what we might like, actually, in terms of our behavior. Some models are actually uh, not mundane, but actually quite, uh, quite um, uh, impactful. Uh, we use models to predict the behavior of drugs in, uh, in humans before actually uh, testing the new human. So obviously, in this case, a, a model is uh, a little bit of a, of a uh, mis misnomer for, for um, uh, our animals here. But certainly, they are, they are models that uh, allow us to predict the behavior in, uh, in a different species. And then there are obviously models that impact our future. Uh, you might be familiar with the chairman of the Federal Reserve in the United States here. And so the financial models are used continuously to, to uh, give us ideas about uh, our, our future and, and how we can uh, adjust, perhaps, uh, our, our trajectory to, to improve on, uh, uh, on you know, financial outcomes in this case. So there are models of all, of all sorts. Now, the question is, what makes them wrong or useful? So what, and first of all, what is this difference? Why? They're either uh, wrong or useful. Um, in, in describing that, I thought that maybe uh, we should go back to, to a, a, an example that is, I'm sure you're very familiar with, uh, which is the prediction of the motion of planets. Um, it turns out that um, um, there is a long history, obviously, of, of predicting that and, and building models that represent the, the motion of planet. The starting point, if we go back uh, centuries, is actually uh, uh, Earth in the center and the planets on, on circular orbits. This was the model 
that was developed uh, for, for quite a bit um, in, uh, uh, from, from ancient uh, 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 time till uh, relatively recently. Um, but the, the truth is that this model cannot really reproduce observations. So, for example, in this model, the motion of some planet, planets is retrograde and obviously cannot really be easily accommodated in, in this setting. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, there was evolution of this modeling, of this theoretical framework to model the motion of planets that led to epicycles. So the planets not only are on circular orbits, but are, are on circular orbits around the orbits themselves. Uh, really with this um, idea and these constraints that the orbits have to be circular. And so this was the idea, eventually this idea got, you know, developed even more, more and more sort of adjustment to the theory. Uh, so from, from epicycles to even more epicycles, but it turns out there was still something missing in this theory. And uh, um, in spite of that, uh, if you go back to, you know, the discovery or the, the travel of Christopher Columbus in, uh, in the United States, in, the, in North America, it was clear that even that uh, erroneous model was able to give predictions that were useful. In this case, you know, sort of the idea of predicting a, 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 a lunar eclipse might seem like a, a, a supernatural power to uh, the, the, the people who were actually exposed to that prediction, even if, in, in principle, the, the, the model was completely wrong, right? It was completely the wrong model to actually predict the motion of the planet, but was sufficient to predict something like that with an enormous impact. So the question is, uh, uh, obviously, moving forward, the breakthrough was that uh, the, the Earth was not in the center, obviously. Um, and uh, it turns out also that ellipses would work much better than circles to reproduce observations. Now, it turns out that the, the, the laws that were derived at that time, Kepler uh, and, and others, were completely based on observation. So this is what we call today a data-driven model, right? It's completely based on observation of, of motion of a planet, and it, was, it wasn't clear why they worked. So this was a black box model, if you like, what we refer to as a black, mo black box model today um, that is completely driven by observation. And, and, uh, and the caveat here is kind of interesting that uh, uh, Kepler really did not like the idea of using ellipses instead of circles. So the idea that the theory was not as elegant as it used to be, but still was actually good representation of the, of the, um, of the observation that were out there. Now, it turns out, again, depending on, on what was the use of this model, you know, supposedly uh, if we were trying to build up a mission to, to the moon again, um, in this case, it's not just predicting the, the um, uh, eclipse, but actually visiting, traveling. Well, it turns out the, in this particular case, although these Kepler rules were, were effective in reproducing the observation, would be a completely wrong model to try to land on the moon. The, the reason for that is because, at least in, in principle, the laws themselves did not include gravity, right? Gravity was, was introduced by, by Newton afterwards as a way to explain the, the uh, trajectory of the planets. And in that sense, that's the fundamental physical law that explains the motion of the planet, but on the other end allows you to plan for a mission to Mars, because now at this point you have an understanding of of how to land there, how to land on the, on, on the, on the moon without, you know, really uh, just worrying about the position of the moon and, and uh, um, uh, so, so sort of going back to, to that, to that uh, um, you know, simple assumption in Kepler rules. So in this case, the idea of that gravity is not in the original model, in Kepler model, but still the model is predictive, is an interesting observation that we'll, we'll discuss, uh, discuss afterwards. Now, it turns out uh, uh, gravity, as you know, is not the whole story. There are you know, specific uh, details of motion of, for example, Mercury that require even more uh, uh, careful analysis beyond sort of Newtonian, Newtonian dynamics. But, but still, uh, the, the, interesting, uh, the, the interesting component here that sort of justifies this idea of usefulness of model, but also models being wrong, is the fact that it's possible that you have the right theory, enough observation, and, and careful analysis, but still you might have an error in the software and you might not remember this uh, uh, um, you know, extreme failure event that occurred a few years ago where um, 
the software that was present in this Mars uh, um, uh, surveyor, this uh, satellite, actually failed and the satellite actually crashed on Mars because there was a unit conversion mistake in the software. So that, that was sufficient to actually, in spite of all the knowledge and so on, to bring the, the satellite down. And so in, in what I'll talk um, moving forward, I, I really exclude errors. I, I consider error to be something that you always want to eliminate, obviously, as much as you, as you uh, possibly can. But focus on the fact that no matter, of, no matter what model you're using, there is always some degree of uncertainty in the way we actually can, can use them and in the way we can actually build confidence in the results. And so just to answer this question, the application of interest and the context will actually be sort of the key to decide if a model is actually wrong, you know, useful or not useful in a sense. Now, what are the models that I worry about or I work on in, in, my, in my research? They, they tend to be based on uh, what we call engineering simulations. So models of this sort, so simulations that represent, in this case, the, the reacting flow, the turbulent reacting flow in a, in a combustion uh, system, in this case, a jet engine. Um, and, and the questions, the context for this kind of simulation is to try to understand uh, certification of, of the emissions for, for this kind of system. What is the level of, for example, pollutants that are emitted by, by the system, but also the durability, how much the, the conditions in the system affect the, the, the life of the system itself. So these kind of questions require models that have very specific level of accuracy so that we can understand these, these questions of certification. Um, other models that I worry about are, are models that are uh, uh, useful in, in designing um, uh, energy, uh, uh, solar energy receivers, in this case, uh, uh, to, to extract energy and transfer energy to a fluid. In this case, again, these are turbulent multiphase multi flows uh, coupled with radiation. Um, and in this case, the questions are very, very different. In this case, this is a pre-design of a system that doesn't exist. What, what we are worrying about is try to understand if there is enough potential in the performance that is worthwhile actually building a system like this. Um, other system I have been working on are, are related to um, evaluation of the effectiveness of, of uh, uh, drug and aerosol deposition in, in the upper airways. Uh, in this case, one of the things we worry about is the sensitivity of the, of the um, aerosol inhalation to the specific in, you know, patient uh, uh, airways, the, the morphology of the airways. Um, and so in this case, again, the question becomes, how can we ensure a certain level of accuracy in the deposition of, of drugs independently of the interpatient uh, variability? And then uh, the final uh, problem I'll, I, we are actually working on today, and I'll, I'll mention it very briefly. I, I talked about this in, uh, in, a, in another talk at, uh, at the Mechanical Engineering Department, is um, a new way of actually building ignition for, for uh, uh, rocket engine, for uh, rocket combustion systems, in this case based on, on laser energy deposition. And you can see here a turbulent jet and then a, a, a very short pulse laser that uh, deposits energy that then eventually leads to, to combustion. Now, in all these systems, what, what we do is that we have a, a mathematical model, some, some sort of mathematical representation of the real system um, uh, that involves typically uh, complex physical processes. Turbulence is, as mentioned before, has been sort of my, the, the focus of my, my whole career. So uh, this, this system has a very, very important influence related to the, to the dynamics of turbulence. But the other uh, part that is important is this idea of high consequence scenarios. What this means is that we are interested in these simulations because we are trying to make decisions that might affect, uh, might have a, a big impact both in terms of uh, a technology, perhaps uh, uh, cost of the technology, but perhaps also in terms of uh, um, you know, societal impact or, or human impact if we're talking about uh, delivering drugs, for example. Um, so what, the, what are the principles? The, the starting point is typically some level of experience or prior knowledge about the system and some physical principles that we use to actually uh, define the mathematical framework. Then we, we write down specifically what are the, the governing equation, really the, the, the mathematical model that uh, represents the system, the system of interest. And typically, at least in, in my the, the problems I deal with, the partial differential equations are, are the key sort of mathematical tool that we use. Um, after that, obviously, we cannot, or, or in, in most 
uh, practical situation, we cannot really compute solutions analytically of those, of those mathematical models. So we use some sort of a computational algorithm. And because of the size and the complexity of the problem we deal with, we typically need to use supercomputers. In this case, very, very large scale computers. And then only after all this process, then we end up with, with some sort of a prediction. Now, um, the, the, uh, the, the element, again, I'll contrast it to, to a completely different class of model. The, 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 mo the element that makes the model I deal with uh, specific is the fact that we try to be as close to first principle as possible. First principle are, are uh, theoretical statements that, that have been sort of validated and justified in terms of observation and can be used sort of directly to build these simulations. So we'll see, as I said, a, a different uh, perspective on this uh, um, uh, towards, towards the end. So now, the, the one thing I didn't talk about are uncertainties. So what is that, that I refer to when I talk about uncertainties? So there are certain, uh, there are uh, specific um, uh, elements of uncertainty that, that I'm sure are, are um, uh, very familiar to all of you. Uh, one thing that, that you might um, refer to is what happens when we uh, manufacture parts for engineering uh, processes, that there are clearly tolerances, which means that what we are designing is not exactly what we are manufacturing, what we are producing. And the difference there is an uncertainty, that different geometry. Um, and the question becomes if that geometrical difference is actually relevant or not, is important or not in terms of, for example, the performance of the system we are building. So that's one, one type of uncertainty. Um, another type is uh, un uncertainty that comes in a more natural way because of, for example, interpatient variability. In this case, you're looking at um, uh, bifurcation in the cardiovascular system in four different individual, individuals. And, and obviously, you see the, the, the main uh, uh, cardiovascular system bifurcates in ways that, that has quite a bit of variability. And again, the question is, if we're studying, for example, um, uh, cardiovascular diseases, it's important to capture this variability or perhaps um, we can actually build some sort of neutral average model that gives us sufficiently close prediction to all these four patients. And that's another type of uncertainty that, that we want to deal with. On a completely different, uh, in a completely different direction, there are uncertainty related to choices in the modeling we, we, we consider. In this case, these are two different models that predict the, the path of, of an hurricane. Uh, the European model and the American model. And as you can see, the two models are actually different, right, in terms of their prediction, which means that also in terms of the impact that this hurricane might have, in this case, on, on the population in Florida and evacuation that might be required, the, the two models will have a different impact in terms of what decisions might be made if, if we use them. Now, why these two are different? Well, different. well the, the simplest uh, answer to that is because they are based on different assumptions. So the models are built on assumptions we made on, say, the, the dynamics of hurricanes, and, and the Americans and the Europeans, in this case, made different assumptions that lead to different predictions. And so, once again, this is an uncertainty that is very, very important to characterize, because based on, on the uncertainty in this prediction, again, we might make different decisions on, on what to do next. And to clarify, I would say that the first two types of uncertainties are what I, what I call natural randomness, or uh, in, in a sense, they represent variability that is in the system. It's not something we can eliminate. You know, interpatient variability is not something you can eliminate. And if you add more and more observation, more and more patients, you'll have a better representation of the variability, but not, a, a, you cannot eliminate it. You don't, don't uh, uh, completely uh, delete it. And so the picture that, that I have in mind and sort of to give you a sense is that although our target is always to, to, to do a prediction that is uh, accurate, in a sense, because of the uncertainty, our predictions tend to be sort of a, a, a fan around the, the, uh, the, right, the right target, a sort of a, 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 a noise, if you like, around that, that target. On the other hand, if we use models that have different assumptions, what we are doing is that we are building um, uh, a, a bias into the system. We are building some sort of a, a shift into our prediction. Rather than being exactly accurate, exactly accurate it's going to be moved to, to a certain degree. And obviously, different models will give you a different bias. But the fundamental difference between these two is that in this case, we can actually build a better model. Right? Although in the case of the hurricane, we might not know exactly how to do it, in principle, 
The reason why there are these differences in the European and American model is some sort of assumption that was made in one and not in the other. And it's clear that one of the assumptions that is made is you know, incorrect, perhaps they are both incorrect. And the idea is that we could actually build a better model that eliminates that, that uncertainty altogether. It might not be cost effective to do it, but at least in principle we can. So, um, as I said, then, then the, the uncertainties have, have sort of this duality. They're either related to, to natural variability or they might relate to, to assumption. But in both cases, these are clearly important to characterize. And so now, what do we do to try to predict uh, in, a, in a, uh, a practical setting when we do have uncertainty? We, we try to quantify the uncertainty. So, again, going back to the hurricane scenario, one of the, the, the classical procedures that we use is that we actually build predictions with different models. These different predictions might be uh, related to, again, different assumptions we make or perhaps different initial conditions of, say, the temperature of the wind conditions in, in a particular scenario before we start the prediction. So we build an ensemble of models, an ensemble of model prediction, and then we uh, um, uh, average or we construct an average behavior um, that, that gives us a sort of a, a, an expected part of the hurricane and then a prediction interval that will give us the spread among all the predictions. And so this is now actionable in the sense that in this case, we might need to pick one. In this case, we say the collective knowledge based on all these ensemble simulation gives us an expected scenario and a prediction interval. And this is exactly what we do now in a more general setting with simulations. So rather than simply assuming that we, we know everything about the system and we compute a, a, a outcome of interest, say the temperature field in the system, what we do is that we introduce the uncertainties in, say, the operating scenario, the manufacturing, and so on. We uh, introduce the, the biases due to modeling that we make, say, in the combustion kinetics and in the, in the turbulence. And we build an ensemble that eventually gives us our prediction. Okay, so the, the fundamental process is similar to what I shared before. The challenge, though, is that this calculation and these uh, problems tend to be extremely, extremely complex to handle. Even just one prediction tends to be extremely uh, um, uh, expensive computationally. And so the, the question becomes, how can we make these efficient, cost efficient, so that we can do predictions with uncertainty at a cost that is still um, reasonable? Um, and uh, the, the research that, that we do, at least in my group, is, is sort of really fundamentally related to this idea of going beyond sort of doing simply an ensemble and averaging the results. And it touches uh, various different uh, disciplines. It is grounded in statistical theory. Um, typically, we use multi-fidelity strategy with the, have, have a connection to the idea of control variance in statistics, but they, they tend to be uh, uh, related to, to, to statistical uh, uh, sampling, sort of advanced statistical sampling. Um, the second element is, is uh, approximation theory. So we try to build methods that rely on the fact that our solution tend to be smooth, tend to have some sparsity properties or properties that we can take advantage to accelerate the, the estimation. Um, it does include domain-specific knowledge and, and, and uh, in particular, the physics of the problem. Uh, this is because, again, otherwise you cannot really quantify the effect of assumptions. The assumptions tend to be related to physical choices that you make in terms of modeling. And then finally, leverages advances in, in computer science and programming so that we can try to be efficient in using modern systems, for example, heterogeneous uh, CPU, GPU, uh, computing system. So all this is sort of the, the picture of, of the research that we do in, in my group, and it, it's a nice uh, intersection of, uh, of uh, various disciplines that give you sort of the, the field of uncertainty quantification that, I'm, I'm in, you know, that I've been involved in. Interestingly enough, the same sort of uh, four disciplines are actually part of uh, uh, what we do in, uh, in, uh, in ICME, and so I wanted to uh, just give you a, a, a one slide uh, on, uh, on the Institute for Computational Mathematical Engineering that I'm director of at Stanford. It's a graduate program, um, so it, it issues uh, masters and PhDs. So if, you, if anybody's interested in, in, uh, in uh, learning more about the program, this is the website. But the, the mission and, and sort of the tagline of the, of the Institute is that we do research and education at the intersection of, of these disciplines, really. Um, to understand 
uh, problems that have both technological and societal impact. So technology and engineering is a critical piece, but not the only element. There is a lot of work in, in social sciences, in medicine, and, and so on, that goes on in, in ICME. So again, if you're interested, please uh, um, visit our website and, or, or just contact me and I, I can give you uh, more information. Now, um, having said that, let me um, uh, switch, uh, sort of put all this picture together in, in what I call the science of prediction, which is the idea that we want to use simulations to do, um, uh, to have uh, 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 forecasts that have quantified uncertainty, explicitly reflect the presence of uncertainty in uh, scenarios that are uh, of, of high consequence. I'll give you a couple of case studies just to give you a sense of sort of the methodology, the challenges, but also the kind of answers that we can get out of these studies. Um, the first one is, uh, um, is um, a, a problem that has to do with uh, um, uh, nuclear waste. Um, so the, the, uh, co the context is, the, is a site in the United States called the Hanford site, where there is a, a, a basically a repository of leftover waste from uh, various sources. Uh, uh, actually, these days, mostly medical devices. But the truth is that the challenge with this uh, storing is the fact that there might be hydrogen buildup in, this tank, in these tanks that store the material that eventually can lead to explosion and, and obviously um, uh, release of, uh, of radioactive and, and dangerous material. Now, why this is a challenging problem um, is mostly because of the, um, of the you know, the physics that occur within these tanks. They are very much related or challenged by the composition, what kind of material there is, what is happening in terms of chemical reactions, thermochemical reaction in the system. Um, but on the other hand, it's important to, to understand and, and forecast the behavior of the system and also uh, identify remedial actions. What can you do if we are getting close to, to a, 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 an extreme event, an extreme scenario, for example, of an explosion? Um, to give you a, a sense of the, of the uncertainty in the system, the, the first and most critical uncertainty is that we, we don't really know what's in the tanks. So there is not really a, a very, very careful uh, catalog of what is actually in each one of these tanks, and there are you know, dozens of these tanks. And more importantly, in time, this, the composition changes because, as I said, thermochemical reactions occur in this system. So understanding exactly what is in the tank is the first uncertainty. We just simply don't know. And the second, we are not completely aware of the physical processes that occur. Some of these complex reactions between um, you know, materials that are uh, uh, perhaps aging are, are not completely uh, well understood. And so this is a major, major source of uncertainty. On the other end, what we can do is to actually build some sort of forecast that is probabilistic based on uh, what we know best in terms of the system. So an initial composition, perhaps, and some of the uh, chemical pathways that we expect to, to occur there. And so what we can do is that we can actually estimate what is the, the concentration within the tank, what is the probability that the concentration within the tank reaches certain, certain degrees. So this is a, a, just a depiction of the probability distribution. So at that point, what we can do is to assess if that concentration becomes risky, becomes too much in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, system uh, safety. Um, and, and at that point, we can also uh, communicate that to you know, decision makers that have to decide what to do. Now, before, before going that, though, it's kind of an interesting that as part of the uncertainty quantification process, in addition to quantify the concentration of, of hydrogen in a tank, we can actually build a, a, a sort of a breakdown of what contributes most to the actual uncertainty in the, in the uh, distribution of hydrogen. So we can say we have all these sources of uncertainty, the composition and, and the physical mechanism and so on. We can say which one contributes more to the, to the spread in the concentration of, of uh, hydrogen in the tank. And it turns out the, the most important factor is the temperature, not the composition. And so this, this came as, a, as a, a surprise in a sense. The temperature contributes more than 50% of that uncertainty in H2, which is not surprising if you think of sort of a thermochemical process where obviously temperature controls the speed of the reaction. So it's not quite the reactions that matter, but how quickly those reactions are actually occurring. 
And, and so the, the interesting thing is that if you now know that the temperature is the, is the critical element, you can build a system that allows you to monitor this tank very, very easily without, again, having to know a lot about the composition and eventually build up a, a decision that lets you, you know, sort of understand if the temperature is reaching a certain limit, you can actually, um, uh, you know, visit the tank and, and take some actions. So, for example, that action can be, the actions can be to um, uh, ventilate the tank or, you know, to avoid the uh, explosion or perhaps move some of the content to a different, to a different tank. Right? And so the idea is that uncertainty quantification and this kind of analysis allow you to quantify what is the risk in each one of these tanks and decide if a remedial action can be taken and which one uh, is the appropriate remedial action in this case. And so the, it turns out this study, I'm, I'm not going to go in the details, but this study sort of identified of, uh, about a dozen tanks, so, some tanks, the, the red ones, that actually have a, a higher risk of uh, uh, incurring an explosion, and some tanks instead that have a very, very low risk, and so they can actually be used as a, as a um, repository for additional material that can be moved from one tank to another. And so this shows, again, that the idea is not, not necessarily to predict uh, the, the behavior of this system in, a, in an extremely accurate way or in a 100% uh, uh, accurate way, but actually quantify the uncertainty leads to decisions that actually re lead to uh, better safety in the system. Um, the second case study that, that I want to make is going back to this idea, something is missing in the model that I mentioned with gravity before. Um, in this case, the context is uh, uh, modeling uh, ice shelves and modeling heat transfer in the context of ice shelves. Um, and, and obviously, this is an important uh, element of, of a number of the models we use for both weather and climate, uh, uh, understanding exactly what is the, the, the heat transfer condition in that system. Uh, the model I use is, a, is extremely simple. Um, is a model in which uh, I have water in a cavity. I have uh, two walls, one that is cold, is sort of representing the ice. The other represents sort of uh, the, the ocean, sort of away from the, from the uh, ice, uh, ice shelf itself. And the question is, what is the transfer in this, in this system? Right? How can we measure the transfer in the system computationally? Um, and as I said, that's obviously critical for, for understanding some of the process and the dynamics in the, in the ocean in the, in the, uh, for, for climate prediction. Um, now, it turns out that uh, the problem is very simple, and the reason why it's uh, is, uh, uh, something that we use in this, in this setting is because we believe that we have a very good control on the, on the equations that govern the flow. This is a thermal fluid problem that is sort of uh, um, uh, available in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, knowledge uh, in, uh, uh, in the literature. What are the uncertainties in the system? We assume that the cold temperature is fixed, so it's zero degrees, and, and that's you know, a good assumption in this case. But we assume the hot temperature, so the, the liquid water, the temperature on the other side, is actually not quite well known. It depends, obviously, on, on the condition of where we are in the ocean. But the other part that is important that we don't want necessarily assume is what is the equation of state? What is the relationship between the density and the temperature of the water? Right, this uh, density as a function of temperature. Now, we know that uh, in a system like this, um, uh, the, the currents are generated, water uh, flow is, is generated just by the presence of, uh, of difference in temperature. Um, and it turns out the experimental evidence shows that there is a clear trend, that the density of the water decreases with temperature. This is not unexpected. In fact, the currents, both in air and water, are generated because High temperature leads to lower density and then uh, water or air that actually you know, floats um, or, or uh, um, uh, moves, moves upward compared to cold water that moves downward. And so the, the idea is that we can build models at this point for this relationship that are consistent with the data. So there are all these linear models. We can build an ensemble of these linear models that will give us a sort of a behavior that is consistent with these measurement, and, and the measurements are reported here as bars to sort of indicate that there is some uncertainty in the measurement themselves. Now, if we do that, the, the uh, uh, model prediction actually agree with the expected behavior. So what we see here is that the flow of the water within the tank has a, has a circular motion, so you have cold water sinking and hot water raising. 
Um, and also in terms of heat transfer, if we actually look at the, at the temperature in, within the system, actually, you know, across the, 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 bottom, uh, the bottom wall here, you see actually that the temperature drops quite quickly here. So the, the gradient is a representation of the heat flux. It's a very high heat flux in that, in that uh, region and then eventually sort of drops. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that if we compare these to a, an assumption where the density doesn't change, so the density of the water is not affected by temperature, then we also know what the solution will be. It will be simply a straight line between the two temperatures. This will be like a, you know, a quote unquote, a solid. And the flux in that case will be much lower than what we see. So the, we, we sort of know and expect that the water and the currents in the water are a factor that increases the heat transfer in the system. And this is a good way to quantify what it is. The, the other thing that you don't see here, simply because the, the uncertainty is extremely small, is that the changes in that the linear behavior of the, of the density really have a very, very small effect. And, and this is because overall, um, the idea is that as soon as there is a density difference, you are driving this current and then the currents eventually give you the heat transfer. So it's not the, the density itself. The density is really just the source of the initial motion, but eventually the, the dynamics of the motion of the fluid flow is what determines the heat flux. Now, it turns out that uh, this, or this uh, conclusion seem to indicate that we don't have to worry about uncertainty. The uncertainties are, are, are small and we have a good handle of what is the actual uh, uh, increase in the flux due to the, the currents in this system. Well, it turns out there is a, a, an important failure here of this analysis that sort of goes back to say there is something missing in this model. So if you look at the experimental data and the choice that we made in terms of the, of the uh, density, uh, the density change with respect to temperature, there are a lot of other options that we could have uh, included in this. So these are some of these options, right? There are some behavior of, of the density with respect to the temperature that are nonlinear, that are still compatible with the experimental data, right? And there is no reason why, a priori, if this is the only thing we know, we should exclude those, those behavior, those, those additional uh, uh, equation of states. And so it turns out that if we actually consider those, the behavior is extremely, extremely different. So this is a case where the temperature is linear. This is the model I was showing you before. When the behavior is nonlinear, you actually start seeing uh, multiple um, uh, 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 circular motion, multiple currents in the system. And it turns out that if we look at experimental evidence in this setting, actually the experimental evidence shows that there are multiple currents in this system, very much like, like this behavior. And so the, the idea is that if you include now nonlinearity in this relationship, actually you have an even higher uh, possibility of heat transfer because of these even more accelerated currents that, that occur in the system. And it turns out that uh, uh, this is exactly what happens in reality. We know from the physics that there is a density inversion, that the density behavior is not linear when you're close to the, to the uh, freezing point, uh, zero degrees here. And the data, as I said, actually represent that. We could actually eliminate that uncertainty if we could make the measurement very, very accurate. These dots here are precise measurement of the density that, again, are consistent with initial uncertainty, but will give you a behavior that now is, is not linear. Very much like what we used uh, in, the, in the second class and second ensemble of models. And more importantly, as I mentioned, the heat flux corresponding to the linear model is actually smaller than the heat flux corresponding to this nonlinear model. There is also some re residual uncertainty. So you, as you can see, the, the predictions now show a, a little bit of a range, but not much. The, the important conclusion, though, that the heat flux is always higher than what was predicted with the linear model. And so if you were using that assumption before to infer conclusions about the heat transfer at the, at the ice shelf, you will be surprised by seeing that actually it's very likely that heat transfer is actually much higher. And again, as part of the uncertainty quantification, we are able to, to build models that account for the evidence and leading to more accurate predictions without really having to resort necessarily to uh, accurate measurements. We were, you know, the, the idea of knowing about the, the density inversion is something that came afterwards. You can actually account for the potential uncertainty directly by building more general, more general model that satisfy the, the experiments. Now, the, the last example I have is, uh, um, is the model that I shared with you on, uh, on the 
ignition of a of the laser um, ignition based on a on a laser energy deposition in a in a rocket. Now, the, in this in this case, the the interesting um, question or the question we're interested in is about reliability. What is the probability of uh, successfully igniting this system? And again, here I'm showing a, an ensemble of simulations, eight simulations that are nominally the same. The only difference is the underlying uh, uh, turbulent field at which we are um, sending these uh, energy pulse. Because the energy pulse is such a low, uh, a short duration, just a slight uh, shift corresponding to a different instantaneous initial condition for the turbulent field actually leads to failure actually uh, in two out of these eight cases. And as I mentioned, this is, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, this is also something that is um, uh, confirmed experimentally. These are uh, a and picture of uh, three uh, scenarios corresponding to, to some of the, of the eight below. And again, you see that one is actually not igniting and two are, are igniting, even if, again, nominally is the, same, is the same scenario. And this is work, you know, currently ongoing, but the idea is that uh, uncertainty, again, will be used, uncertainty quantification will be used as a mean to actually understand exactly how to model this scenario and how to build confidence in a, in a prediction of reliability. I want to finish the, the, the lecture by uh, talking a little bit about AI and, and ML. It seems like every time we have a, a discussion about modeling, um, this is obviously uh, uh, a question that, that comes up. So what about them? Well, um, in, in a little bit of, of controversial stand, a few years ago, um, the, uh, the, the statement that I made at the beginning was modified a little bit, but in a different way. All models are wrong, and increasingly you can succeed without them, which was, again, a sort of a, a, a very extreme take on, on, uh, on what uh, um, you know, uh, George Box said initially. Now, it turns out that uh, um, the, the basic idea and the basic uh, um, uh, sort of uh, research that, that led to some of these statements has to do with actually great uh, successful story that uh, they came out of, for example, from, from Google. This is uh, how easily or how effectively uh, Google researchers were able to build synthetic phases out of a, a machine learning algorithm. Um, the, these are an evolution sort of in, the la in, in five years' time of how sort of initial effort eventually led to really realistic looking uh, 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 fake sort of humans. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, you know, should you be skeptical? Should you believe uh, that effectively we can use data directly to build, to build models and, and exclude completely theory? Well, um, I, I, I think it's useful to um, uh, sort of put in context what these uh, uh, data-driven models are. They are statistical algorithms that learn from data and, and learn to produce new data, basically, new, generate new data. Uh, the way this model works in particular is that you have a, a, a database of, of information, in this case just faces, just to be uh, connected to that example. Uh, from these you build some sort of a statistical learning algorithm it can be as easy as building an average of all these faces and producing a mean individual, or you know, more sophisticated as an as a, you know, autoencoder or some sort of a machine learning uh, deep network uh, uh, to, to build, to extract information and then produce, generate new, new information. Typically what happens is that this algorithm is trained on, on a, a very large amount of these examples. Uh, so we typically use, again, large scale uh, GPUs to do, to do this kind of analysis, and then eventually this generates new, new um, outcomes. And as I mentioned, it's been, it's been very successful. So the uh, idea that this, these things can work is actually, you know, has been proved in, in a number of different fields. Now, I, I, I report this, this sentence from, uh, from uh, 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 Taleb that is, is really sort of a good driver. I'm, I'm a skeptical, but the truth is that um, you, you know, you really need to, to be open to function in, in this world, especially in the, in the context of, uh, of new statistical learning algorithms or, or new tools that you can use for statistical learning. So let me, let me show you an example of what we did to try to move from synthetic phases to synthetic flows. So we did basically the same. We built a, a database of flows, in this case, flows around different geometries that give you a, a field of, uh, in this case, velocities. Um, we, we use a very, very straightforward computational uh, statistical learning algorithm, in this case, a, a, an autoencoder. 
And the, the, the result is that we can actually build prediction on inputs that have not been seen, so geometries that are not part of the database, that actually is, is, is quite compelling, quite accurate. So this is the experience that we have had and the experience that many have had in this field. Uh, there are some caveats. It's not all uh, simple or all that simple to build uh, a database to, to train the network and so on and so forth. But even assuming that that's not the case, uh, what is the accuracy that we can expect on, on really different geometries? So we trained all on geometry that look different in terms of shape, but we're always a sort of an isolated geometry in a uniform flow. So what happens if we have two geometries? What that happens if we have, you know, even more uh, complex embedding of geometries, right? These were not really something that the, the data-driven model has seen in terms of the training. And, and now does it behave? Well, it turns out, I've, I've, you know, we do have uh, predictions um, and we can compare to true solutions. And if you actually look at these two columns, a priori, you know, it's not very easy to tell, actually, if there are differences. So it's not, I would say, it's not a, a complete failure. And, but, but on the other end, it's extremely difficult to say because some of the features, for example, in this case, the wake, this red area is much uh, uh, lower, is much shorter than what the, the machine learning algorithm gives us, the synthetic output generated by the machine learning. But a priori, you wouldn't really guess that this is a wrong result, right, unless you had the truth. And so this, me this means that the, these models are deceptively accurate or, or perhaps, perhaps are, are, are you know, very, very uh, close to be true. And perhaps there is something you can do uh, to, to even improve them more. And there is actually a lot of work in that context. And so is there a different paradigm for, for simulation? Well, what I showed you with physics-driven model compared to data-driven model, certainly a completely, completely different framework. But it turns out it's nothing new. Uh, this is a, 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 a typical deduction process where you go from theory to data. This is a typical induction process where you go from data to theory, right? And, and in many ways, we know that these are both, you know, valid, val very common strategies to approach a, an unknown, a new problem. And uh, uh, the, the truth is that the, the confidence comes in the case that the assumptions are valid in, in the deduction setting. And uh, uh, the, if the evidence and the data is sufficient in the, in the data-driven setting. So there is still the same idea that you can build confidence and you can build quantification of uncertainty. It's just that the context is very different. Um, I would argue also that uh, uh, what is a model is different in these two contexts. In the physics-driven setting, the assumptions are part of the model. I would argue that in the case of data-driven model, the data sets is part of the model. And so the model itself is, is tied and directly connected to the, to the idea of the, of the data that is used to train. And this actually makes the data-driven model a little bit more uh, difficult to, to also reproduce and, and to communicate to others, because now you have to make sure that the access to those databases is the same so that people can follow the same procedure. Whereas typically in the setting of the, of the um, uh, physics-driven model, the assumptions are just stated as, as you know, statement, as just very, very simple, um, very simple uh, conditions. Um, I, again, I'm, I mentioned that this is not a new argument, so you might uh, be familiar with this painting from, from uh, Raphael of the, the School of Athens, and the two fellows in the middle are, are Plato and Aristotle, and they are connecting, you know, either to the, to the heavens, in this case theory, or to the land, to practice, to observations, to data, right? And, and they are arguing which one is the right approach. So this is really not new. This is exactly sort of the scientific process that we've been following. And, and again, the, the idea is that I personally think that there is nothing more practical than a good theory, but the truth is that there is a value in sort of building this connection between the two, the two, um, the two fields. So concluding, um, I, I, I like to conclude uh, discussion about uncertainty with a, with a, a sort of a, a, a mini story that has to do with uh, uncertainty being, in my opinion, the difference from success and failure. Uh, the way I, I think of it is that actually there, is, there are more quadrants. Uh, if you ignore uncertainty, I, I like to think of it as just wishful thinking. We just cannot ignore uncertainty. Uncertainty is always present in everything we do in terms of using models. Um, and I, I like to contrast that to prudent analysis, which is analysis that effectively accounts for the uncertainty that we identified. 
And uh, um, as I said, uh, the the you know the good the best place to be in these quadrants is this side where you are successful because you've done prudent analysis. This is what I would call good engineering. Counter to that is when you fail because you ignored it, you ignored the uncertainty, and I, I would simply call that negligence. Now, it's interesting, there are other two quadrants. I would, you know, I would like to believe that if you're successful for the wrong reasons, you're just lucky. And on the other hand, if you're unsuccessful, but for the right reasons, that's what, what we call an honorable failure, which is actually NASA wording for, for failure that occurred during the Apollo process, the Apollo uh, program. So uh, let me finish by acknowledging the US Department of Energy that funds most of my research in uncertainty. And there are way too many students and uh, postdocs to, to thank. So I'll just thank one, uh, um, my ex-student, Zach, who is now an assistant professor at Olin. It turns out all model are uncertain is the title of the textbook we're putting together. Hopefully it will be out at the end of the year. So hopefully that will be something that uh, um, I can share with you next time we'll, we'll see each other. So I'll stop here and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for the philosophy how mathematics, how to use mathematics correctly to understand true physics. Thank you very much. So uh, now let's take some questions from our audience. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, I have a very basic question about the part that you mentioned that uh, some types of uncertainty are not, redu are not uh, reducible, okay? So suppose we are flipping a coin and the coin is a 50-50 chance, supposedly. So how would you say whether there is some way to reduce this uncertainty or not? I would like to know your personal understanding of this process, that whether it is possible to reduce this uncertainty 50% or not. That's it. Yeah, that, thank that's you. a great question. So. Um, in principle, that, that uncertainty um, is um, connected to the specifics of the coin itself. So if you're using always the same coin or use a different coin, and in that case, there will be potentially some difference in, in the weight, in the you know, surface finish and so on. Um, and so let's say that you can reduce it by always using the same coin. And then the, the next level will be um, you need to control exactly the environment. So if it's completely quiet, you know, meaning no currents versus wind and so on, that will introduce an uncertainty. And then the, you know, and again, you can control it by making it, you know, very, very closely uh, controlled, say, a, a closed, um, a very close environment around it. And then the, the next level will be controlling the exact motion that is used to, to, to launch it, right? And you can use a robot that, that has a very, very high controlled, um, you know, finger to, to leave it. So what I'm describing is a set of actions that you can take to reduce the uncertainty, right? But the truth is that there is, you know, always a level at which it will become impractical or just too expensive to control it. And so you will leave it at that point with the fact that there is some variability remaining. And the only thing you can do at that point is to take that scenario and launch it, you know, a million times. And at that point, you can characterize what is the probability of, you know, getting one or the other, which should be in that case 50-50, right? So in a sense, what I described to you is an uncertainty that is in principle reducible, but it simply becomes too expensive to, to characterize or too complex or, or just, you know, uh, at that point, really meaningless to try to characterize. And so you stop with that, and then you say, now I don't reduce it anymore, but I can characterize it very well by just repeating that test a million times. Okay? okay. So that's the difference, you. you know, fundamental difference between the two. Uh, thanks. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, I would like to follow up on your comment in which you repeat the experiment multiple yes. times. Uh, if you take something like a dynamical system, they can be chaotic. So in some cases, you may not even be able to find out all possible uh, states that the system evolves to. So uh, do you have any comments on how uncertainty relates with such chaotic behavior? Yeah, that, that's, that's certainly related. Um, I, I think if you go back to sort of the definition of, of chaos as a, um, as a um, 
high sensitivity to initial condition sort of tells you that, again, it's a controllability problem, right? I mean, if you could really control the initial condition perfectly, you don't expect the behavior to be chaotic, meaning that you have always different responses, right? The reason why you have these different responses is because you don't control the initial condition completely. And as I said, it's impractical to do it. So it's not that I'm asking or, or expecting that that will happen. But to some degree, the, the, um, the understanding is that there is a cost and there is a complexity associated to control, in that case, the initial condition. And you can decide to stop at some point and say, I'll just treat it as an additional source of randomness. And then, obviously, you, the consequence is the chaotic behavior. So potentially, you know, bifurcation, very, very highly different behavior of the system in that case. But the, the origin of the problem remains the controllability of the initial condition. And in turbulence, this happens all the time. And so what we do is that we know that there is a high, high sensitivity to initial conditions. But it turns out that if you are interested in a, in a statistical behavior of the fluid flow, then we don't actually worry about initial condition because we average them. We average the solution in time and in space so, so that those statistics are actually reproducible, are actually independent of the initial condition, or at least very largely independent of the initial condition. Sorry, just uh, one more question yeah. then. Since you uh, spoke about uh, fluid dynamic simulations, uh, I, I've read some papers from the CTC at Stanford. Uh, usually, uh, since you run them on computers, you can only get like a, a finite number of digits for your precision, right? Yes. So uh, could you also uh, like talk a little bit about how like numerical noise uh, affected some of the results that you generated? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a very important point. Um, so numerical noise, or you can think of truncation error, right? the fact that on a computer you cannot compute, um, say, you, you cannot do um, uh, mathematical um, uh, evaluations with infinite precision, so that you will have some sort of precision that is left. Um, so we, you know, in that sense, truncation error is an error, is something that supposedly should be eliminated, but, you know, in practice cannot be eliminated, can become more controlled if you have, you know, double precision or quadruple precision or something like that. You can do operations that are effectively more precise, but you cannot eliminate it completely. Now, the, the, the principle or the, the mechanism we use to actually control that error is to ensure that the numerical algorithms we develop are actually stable, which means that small perturbations, for example, coming from trun truncation of the floating point operations, do not affect the dynamics of the solution that we are trying to compute. And so, again, we have to live with numerical algorithms because we cannot solve the equations analytically, but we design numerical algorithms that are stable with respect to these small perturbations so that our results are effectively insensitive to truncation error. Um, but that's one specific uh, type of error that we have to tolerate because it's, it's unavoidable on computers. Yeah, I just pondering now for turbulence, we know we have a runs, we have LES and yes. DNS. They are basically on different resolution to look at the same thing. Now we have different governing equation like uh, Navier stock DNS, the uh, Reynolds averaged. Then we start. Is this possible? We have accumulated so much data. Is this possible? Based on machine learning, based on different cell size, we can generate a new governing equation. They automatically give us DNS and the runs once you change in the mesh size. Um, so is it possible? It is possible. It's, you know, it's certainly something that is attracting a lot of attention, and there are a lot of efforts, you know, including some of our efforts in that direction. Um, I would say we are not there yet, and it's not clear if we can get there um, effectively. The problem in, in data-driven models, I, I didn't talk about it today too much, but I mentioned the idea of data sets, data. Right? The question is what, 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 how we are going to collect the appropriate data to accomplish that task. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. The, the fundamental difference that we have in physics compared to, say, you know, Google for, for faces or for advertising and so on, is that we are fundamentally limited with data. Yeah, we don't have exactly. infinite data. We now, don't have, you know, as you mentioned earlier, from Kepler to Newton, because Newton realized gravity, 
Exactly. Now in the turbulence, what's the, what's the physics <laughs> and the different mesh? You need to realize. So, so I, I, I like this very much. In fact, uh, when you think of DNS and large eddy simulations, they are a brute force approach to, to turbulence. The, yeah, there is yeah. no fundamental breakthrough yeah, in yeah, going from right. runs to DNS, right? DNS is simply saying, I have a bigger computer, I can resolve more scales, I just do it. So the question is really what is missing in runs or modeling of turbulence in that setting that is what was missing with gravity for Newton, right? That, that step has not been taken. Nobody has, has come up with the right idea to, to go from sort of the state of RANS model today to the next level. And DNS is not it. DNS, as I said, is just a microscope. It's just allow you to, to see more and do more, but it's not, it's not a theory. Yeah, Sometimes I also, I thought probably Navistock's equation cannot describe turbulence. Because every star, you see, according to continuum mechanics, everything is connected. They never break down the connection between the fluid element. But in turbulence, we know it's up and down. Definitely, the, they will break down between fluid element. Like we have a fluid mechanic, we have a Lagrangian formulation. Mm -hmm. Lagrangian formulation means everything is connected. But in reality, based on observation, they are not. The DNS can capture turbulence because with the help of a computation, when we use a mesh, we cut the fluid into That's pieces. Right. So but the traditional original government equation don't have this function. So by the computation, we added more into the modeling. Right. So that means the computation probably is beyond the original theory to describe well, the to, nature. To, yeah. to some degree, I think what we are taking advantage of is that the, the noise and the numerical you know, artifacts that come with truncation error feed the you nonlinear know, behavior of the equations and, and sort of sustain you know, some of those dynamics that we see in, uh, in turbulent flows. So that's certainly you know, a, 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 a way to, to, to justify the use of, of direct numerical simulation in, in turbulence. But the, the truth, again, is that you know, it's not a fundamental theoretical step that goes into the direction of understanding turbulence. You know, so, you know DNS, again, is a, is a way to, to look at a, at a microscope. And, and you know, perhaps from looking at this, those DNS results, somebody should, should have an idea of, of what to do and how to model it. But I would say that has really not happened effectively. Okay. Yeah, I just probably the, the flu mechanic is a Still, it's not well defined. <laughs> so, other field. Okay, so uh, should we ask Lin? Lin, do you want to say something, or you want to ask some question? We can give you a chance to to ask a question. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I I I uh, I what should I ask? So I'm actually if I I I, I, I even have no chance to interact with Professor Jinoka Ikarino. This is your chance to interact. <laughs> <laughs> in, in private, actually, technically. But anyway, so my uh, I have one question maybe. So uh, you know there are lots of uncertainties in the large eddy simulation, which is supposed to be the next generation uh, simulation tool for fluid mechanics, especially turbulence, right? And we saw lots of like uh, uncertainties when we compared uh, different, uh, you know, uh, LES code uh, in terms of LES model, SGS model, war model, numerical method. And actually, I, what I observe is that some, some papers that say, look, they claim that there is a good model, good SGS model, good war uh, model, good numerical method in their solver. And in, when, when the other, <clears throat> let's say, uh, the third part, they implement them in their, into their solver, they get different. Uh, Performance. I mean, maybe the performance is very bad, right? So uh, this is uh, uh, so-called uh, relevant to I, I believe that uh, so-called cross-code uh, uncertainties, right? So the same model may have complete different. I mean, very different performance in different uh, solver because the different combination of this uh, is input uh, factor, right? The, the model method yes. uh, employed. So this is a sort of uncertainty. So is there any like a comments or discussion from your part uh, to give us a guideline? How how should we avoid this? Uh, such that we, we all the community are, are on the same way to move forward, right? To 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 move forward. For yeah, the uh, Otherwise, uh, people are playing their own game. So we are not in the same same channel. That's that's a very very um, interesting and, and interesting question, but very difficult to answer. 
So let me let me just say this. Um, the, the basic idea of, of large jet simulation, or the basic challenge in large jet simulation, is that you are um, um, you are using a computational grid that already solves certain scales, say spatially and temporally. So you are naturally sort of um, incurring numerical errors in those calculations, right? In, in, in when you do direct numerical simulation, the expectation is that all the scales that are energetic, that are important, are solved, are captured. And effectively, you can drive the resolution as low as you want because the results, the, the scales effectively are, are captured and the numerical methods become less, less critical. On the other hand, in larger simulation, that's not the case. And so you have the, the challenge of understanding how much, what, what is the, the interaction, if you like, between the numerical error and the actual subgrid model. And that connection remains very, very difficult to, to, um, to establish. So when, when you say the same uh, physical model, subgrid model implementing a different code gives different results, is likely because the, numeric, the effect of numerical error is different. And that you know, sort of leads eventually to different outcomes. So the, the only thing I would say is that uh, at CTR and in, in Professor Moyne's group, there has been quite a bit of work on what's called explicit filtered LES which is the idea that you don't um, compute on, on a, a specific grid, but you're actually writing equations that are for filter quantity, and you actually resolve more uh, scales than actually the ones that you use effectively in the, in the solution of the governing equation. And that at least attempts at separating the numerical error from the subgrid uh, modeling itself. Um, other than that, but the, the problem is that you, you incur an enormous amount of cost in doing that. And so the, the challenge is to justify doing uh, explicit filtering because effectively what you're doing is that you're computing on a very, very fine grid, but then your results are actually defined on a coarser grid. And so you're, in a sense, you're using a lot of resources for a, a relatively coarse calculation. Um, and so the, the question is, how can you do this perhaps in a way that is cost effective? Um, but I think at this point, this is an open question. How do you separate the numerical errors that come from the discretization on course grids with you know, the subgrid modeling that, that you're in, in introducing? And um, you know, I, I, you know, it is an uncertainty, but the nature of the uncertainty is such that it's difficult to quantify because it's not an assumption. It's not that the model is wrong or it's just assumed to be correct and is behaving differently like the, the example I gave you. It's also you know, connected to numerical, grid, numerical errors. And those numerical errors are, are clearly not an uncertainty. That's an error that you know that is present, you know that it's available, and you just cannot eliminate it. You, know, you can eliminate it by going to a finer grid, but then defies the purpose of, of larger dissimulation in the first place. So that's a conundrum at this point on, on larger dissimulation and uncertainties, in my, opi in my opinion. So Thank you. Mean, Thanks uh, for your comments. I think just uh, minimize the errors kind of and uh, it's more sorry. severe <laughs> in the sorry. in the larger dissimulation compared with runs, and it's a still open question. I agree with you. It okay, is thanks. especially because in runs the advantage is that you can get grid converged solutions. They exactly, are wrong exactly. again. The, they they are affected by the assumptions you make, but they are grid converged. They don't have numerical error anymore. Exactly. Right, so there is a, that fundamental difference that I think is very valuable if you want to assess uncertainties. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, I think let's wrap up here. Uh, if you have some further questions, you're welcome to come front to interact with professor directly, maybe. Okay, so I thank think you. let's wrap up here. Thank you. Let's thank again. Thank you.